America's only Irish station, RadioIrish.com, that's what you're listening to, as we turn our attention to the independent film White Irish Drinkers, which stars a tightly knit cast featuring Stephen Lang from Avatar, Peter Riegert from Animal House, Karen Allen from the Indiana Jones series, Nick Thurston from The Ghost Whisperer and Cold Case, Leslie Murphy from House MD, and Jeff Wigdor from Sleepers. Now, the film is produced by John Gray, Melissa Jo Peltier, Paul Bernard, and James Scora, and enjoys a riveting original music score from the hugely gifted Mark Snow, who brought us magnificent compositions such as The X-Files, Kojak, Dynasty, Starsky and Hutch, Heart to Heart, among numerous others. Sure, Snow's music is in everyone's head. The film was shot in just 17 days on location in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, and the film finally made its world premiere at the 2010 Toronto Film Festival and brought the house down, basically. White Irish Drinkers has gone on to become an Audience Award winner of the 2010 Woodstock Film Festival, an official selection of the 2010 Torino Film Festival, and a finalist of the Gotham Festival Genius Award 2010. The movie is also an official selection of the 2011 Atlanta Film Festival and is nominated for the 2011 PRISM Awards in the category Feature Film Substance Use. So the film is making headlines everywhere, it seems, and you can catch up on the latest news at WhiteIrishDrinkersTheMovie.com. Now, the film, which was shot in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, from where writer-director-producer John Gray himself hails, brings us back to early autumn of 1975 and to Brooklyn, where 18-year-old Brian Leary, played by Nick Thurston, is killing time, pulling off petty crimes with his street-tough older brother, Danny, played by Jeff Wigdor, whom he idolizes and fears. But Brian has a secret, you see. He's a talented artist, and in the basement of the bagel shop beneath his parents' apartment, he creates impressionistic charcoal and watercolor images of the stifling city that surrounds him. When he puts on his headphones and paints, shouting matches between Brian's longshoreman father Paddy, played by Stephen Lang, and world-weary mother Margaret, played by Karen Allen, fade into the distance. But even his private world can't block out the brutal beatings his drunken father Paddy inflicts on his brother Danny. Though Paddy has never been physically abusive to Brian, every time he sees his brother's suffering, Brian's heart breaks a little more. White Irish Drinkers is a fascinating look into the private lives of the Learys, an Irish-American family living and working in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, back in the 1970s, and a family rocked to the core with alcoholism, psychological and physical abuse, and general malaise caught in this tragic set of circumstances that eventually brings about the collapse of any real foundation. The film is powerfully delivered by a team of highly skilled actors with Stephen Lang, Karen Allen and Peter Riegert bringing strength to an equally as enthusiastic team of younger and more fresh-faced actors, including the remarkable Jeff Wigdor, who brings us a riveting portrayal of character Danny Leary. A truly remarkable performance in White Irish Drinkers. Powerful stuff altogether. And sure, all the cast of the film work this one to the bone and bring us 90 minutes or so of strong drama and great entertainment. Now, to continue our discovery of the facets that make up White Irish Drinkers the movie, we are entirely delighted to be speaking with writer, producer, director John Gray here on Radio Irish. How are you, John? Hello there, Sean. How are you? I'm grand, John. Now, that's a bit of a juggling act, being the writer, producer and director of your new movie, White Irish Drinkers. Tell me, how did you manage all that? Well, the secret weapon is having uh, great producing partners um, who, who really do so much of the heavy lifting. And, and uh, Melissa Peltier, uh, who I know you've met, uh, my wife, also uh, my producing partner on the movie, and Paul Bernard and James Scurra 
are two really talented producers who have a lot of experience doing movies at this very low budget level, um, as well as big budgets too. But uh, um, so really, you know, with a team like that, you know, you can't go wrong. Tell me, what was it like, John, shooting your own film in the very neighborhood of Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, where I believe you grew up? I did grow up there, yes, and it was it was fantastic. And, and I've always stayed connected to the neighborhood. I haven't lived there in many years, but uh, my mother lived there until she just passed away uh, recently. And so I was, I stayed very connected to the neighborhood. My brother and I, uh, you know, we spent a lot of time in Bay Ridge, and I'm still in touch with a lot of my friends from Bay Ridge that I grew up with. We still see each other. So um, it wasn't like I, I, you know, I came back to the neighborhood after not being there for years, but to go back there to make a movie was 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 really a dream come true and uh, it was just wonderful to be able to try to depict the neighborhood as I remembered it and um, and really just uh, uh, you know you're in the real place you know and everywhere you look at all the real things and and you can't get that anywhere else now with only limited resources your production designer Tommaso Ortino and his crew faced the challenge of bringing your memories of 1975 Brooklyn back to life Tell me, how difficult or otherwise was that, John, to do? Uh, it was definitely a challenge, you know, and, and Tommaso is a really, really brilliant designer, and, um, you know, the philosophy that he brought to it, was a, I thought was very smart, was that the, you know, the richness of that period is in all the little details. You know, not so much about doing big street scenes with, you know, hundreds of cars and, and things that we couldn't afford to do, but when you you're on a, uh, you know in someone's apartment and and you know someone's house and getting all those little details right the napkin holder the telephone the, the grocery coupons you know all those little details in the 70s that that really uh, add up to painting a very rich picture that in and of themselves are not very expensive to find you, know, you just have to know where to look uh, and the art department was great at digging up these these wonderful old treasures <laughs> from 40 years ago uh, and we you know, so we we just really had to be very very careful about what we could show on screen. You know, some of our exteriors, you know, if you pan an inch to the left, you know, whoop, you're seeing something you shouldn't see. So it's really about knowing how to uh, 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 treat the frame in a way that you're only seeing things that, that look like they could be from the 70s. And we were able to use a little bit of CGI. Uh, I was able to call in some favors from people who have worked in the past who, who were able to help us with CGI, for instance, in erasing uh, digitally removing all these satellite dishes, which are everywhere, and we had a lot of rooftop shots, and, and it's always a challenge with the, with the satellite dishes, and and you always know, change street signs and things like that. But mostly, it was in in the details about the way people lived. Now, I've heard uh, some of the locals recognised you from when you were living there yourself, John. Tell me, how were you received in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn, while you were making White Irish Drinkers? Well, I tell you what's funny about that is that my brother Tom. Uh, Tommy Gray uh, was really the neighborhood character. I mean, everyone knew Tommy. And and people you know, might have a vague sense of some familiarity with me, but they're not quite sure. But as soon as I'd say that, I, well, Tommy Gray is my brother. Oh, Tommy Gray. Oh, of course. How's Tommy? <laughs> so, <laughs> that was my calling card. Everywhere I went, uh, everyone knows my brother. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it, a lot of old friends of mine did stop by the set and, and, uh, and you know, check out what we were doing and, and were happy to see me back there shooting. I sure isn't that fantastic. Now, do you think John White Irish Drinkers would be the film that it is today had you shot it anywhere else? No, no. I mean, it, I, I think it's a very Brooklyn-centric movie. Um, you know, I think that people in Brooklyn have a very unique take on life and a very unique... Uh, you know, speech and and everything about everything about Brooklynites, I think, is kind of unique. And I guess I'm prejudiced, but uh, so I, I don't think. Although I mean, now, having said that, I mean certainly, um, that, I mean it's, it's true about the movie really being Bay Ridge and Brooklyn centric, and and uh, we could never have shot it in any other you know on Long Island or in Connecticut. You know, it would never or Toronto, you know, would not have worked. Uh, however, having said that, though, I do think that there are certain universal themes in the movie uh, about the relationships that really could take place, you know, a thousand years ago uh, or in the future. Uh, you know, just the basic stuff that we all live with in family relationships, fathers and sons and brothers and, and, and mothers and, and how we relate to each other.
each other and friends and you know do you go after your dreams or do you not go after your dreams those are all kind of universal themes that I I think would would you know live in any kind of environment that you put the movie in do you think it would have been cheaper John to shoot it somewhere else was it expensive uh, there in Brooklyn being that Brooklyn is so busy well I tell you um, you know New York State has a uh, a wonderful tax incentive to encourage people to shoot in New York. Unfortunately, the city has done away with theirs, which was a very unwise thing for them to do. But New York State still has theirs, and so it actually became very cost-effective to shoot, uh, you know, in New York. And um, you know, we had very, very little money. Uh, we had kind of a low profile. We weren't trying to close down Madison Avenue or you know Times Square. We were just dealing with with some side streets and. And, uh, yeah, so it made it a little bit easier because uh, we left a smaller footprint um, you know, than, than a bigger film would have. But, um, uh, you know, there's this wonderful se- Senator uh, Martin Golden, who's uh, headquartered in Bay Ridge, is a wonderful guy and a big advocate for the uh, tax incentive. And uh, he was also incredibly helpful with us in getting locations that we needed and just helping grease the way for us a little bit uh, in Brooklyn. Right, well now the film stars some big named actors including Stephen Lang, Karen Allen, Peter Riegert and some newcomers to the big screen who we'll talk about in a few minutes. But regarding Stephen, Karen and Peter, uh, had you worked with any of them before, John? I had not. You know, I've been huge fans of, 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 of all of them you know, forever. Um, and uh, uh, I had never worked with them before and I, I couldn't quite believe that we could get them for this movie. And I think it's a testament to them. Um, you know, coming off, you know, they've all done big movies, they've all done big budget movies. Here's Stephen Lang coming off of Avatar, where, you know, their their bagel budget was probably bigger than our whole, you know, movie budget. But it's a testament to them because they knew there was no money and we had no comforts, there were no trailers, there was, you know, just no, none of the luxuries and perks that one gets used to on a big movie. Uh, and they didn't care. You know, they, they just responded to the material and they just wanted to come and work. And, uh, uh, you know, in return, we tried to make it as quick as possible for them. You know, we tried to get all of their scenes done in a short amount of time so we wouldn't tie them up too long. Um, but always be grateful to them for that because they just, just signed on uh, because they wanted to, to do the material. Now, you are also a well-respected director of television, John, including The Ghost Whisperer, which you created yourself. Tell me, how is writing and directing for television different to film? Or is it the same thing, really? You know, in some ways, it is the same. I mean, I have never taken the approach, when I, when I do television, uh, I've never taken the approach of, okay, I'm doing television now, so I have to tell the story differently. Um, in terms of the visual look of it, the way I use the camera, I, I try uh, sometimes to the chagrin of my producers in the studio, but the network, but I try to apply you know, a look to the TV work that I would do on a feature. Uh, you know, there are certain things that, that you run into with you know, networks where they, they want you to, to um, you know, be a little more explicit than you might if you had no, uh, no one telling you to do that. You know, they, they like those audiences to be spoon-fed to a certain degree, and that's, you know, that's always kind of a constant battle. Uh, and that's one of the refreshing things about doing this movie where uh, I, I had a, a very trusted group of collaborators with me to give me really good feedback and, and I could bounce you know, ideas off of. But there was nobody saying, you know what, you can't do that ending because that's just not, you know, it's, it's too violent or, or, you know, can't just explain this more to the audience. It was great not you know, to have that sort of freedom and, and, uh, uh, in that approach. But, you know, basically, it, it, whether it's TV or features, the ultimate thing is, you know, how do you tell the story? Where do you put the camera? And, and it's, it, it really turns out to be the same thing. Now, the story of White Irish Drinkers is a very personal one in so many ways, John, in that you base the story and characters on your very own childhood growing up in Brooklyn, and though not entirely autobiographical, the events and situations in the film are based on very real people, I believe. Would these people uh, recognize themselves in White Irish Drinkers, John? Oh, I, I don't think so. I mean, I think the movie is really a, a composite, you know, of, of many people who pass in, in and out of that neighborhood, uh, people I knew. So, uh, uh, you know, there, there was the, the Peter Wiegert character 
is based on a, on a cousin of mine who was also named Whitey, who was a very, very colorful neighborhood character, and uh, uh, he's passed away now. But, but uh, if he were alive, he would probably recognize himself in this character because he was just uh, always had something going, always had his fingers in a lot of things, and was a very funny and kind of charismatic uh, character. And why, why did you want to tell this story, John? Well, you know, there are a lot of reasons. I mean, one of the reasons that always compelled me to try to do it was that I, I've oftentimes been frustrated with the depiction of, of working class or blue collar neighborhoods or, or characters, you know, on screen and on television, because so often, not always, but so often they're depicted as you know, stupid uh, losers, you know, uh, mouth breathers. And that was so not the experience I had, you know, growing up in that kind of environment. I found the people I grew up with were incredibly smart and cynical and funny. And, you know, they may not have had college degrees, but they really knew how the world worked. And I love that about them. And, it, you know, I, I hopefully carry a lot of that with me still. Um, so in that respect, I, I, I wanted to have a chance to depict those characters in the way that I knew them, the way that I experienced them growing up. So that was one thing. And then the other thing was this notion of, um, of trying to depict uh, a certain way that, that people live, particularly in that era, where you, uh, you didn't quite know if you were safe out on the streets, but you knew how to negotiate that. You knew how to navigate the streets. But the real danger sometimes happened when you closed your door at home at night where you're supposed to be safe. And I knew a lot of people who you know, live with that kind of abuse. And, and so I wanted to sort of do a movie about that, about, about the dangers that, and pressures and, and anxiety and tension that a lot of kids felt uh, growing up in that kind of environment. Now, there are some tense moments in White Irish Drinkers, for instance, when Paddy Leary, played by Stephen Lang, beats the living daylights out of his son Danny, played by Jeff Wigdor. Is there a message here, John, in White Irish Drinkers? Well, I don't know you know, about a message as much as I just, uh, I, I guess I'd like to shine a light on, on, you know, at least in this particular family, you know, why this kind of thing was happening. And I think that the dynamic in that family was that the father, Patty, is so full of self-loathing. You know, he hates himself. He, he deep down knows he's an alcoholic. He knows that he's, he's not doing the right thing really by his family. And he looks at his son, Danny, and he fears Danny's becoming just like him. Uh, and, he, and he hates himself so much that he transfers that to Danny. And it's almost like he's trying to beat himself out of Danny. That's how I always look at it. And Brian escapes the, the violence because his father doesn't really know what to do with him. He doesn't really understand Brian. Um, Brian doesn't seem to be like Patty, so he kind of gets a pass in a way. And what's heartbreaking about it, in my mind, is that Danny really you know, he loves his father at a very deep level. And it's the only father he's ever known. So his way of showing love for his father is to try to be like his father. And that's the one thing that his father can't tolerate. So it's a, you know, it's a, it's a complicated dynamic that I, I think uh, you know, uh, bears some scrutiny. Now, without getting too personal, John, but of course, you are the writer. So it kind of begs the question, did you yourself see some of this violence happening when you were young? You know, I did. I mean, I, we all did growing up in that neighborhood. Uh, you know, it was just part of the currency. I mean, everybody got hit. Uh, it was no big deal. You know, our teachers hit us. The nuns hit us. Um, the brothers in our school hit us. And, uh, you know, it wasn't the kind of thing today where, like, you, you wouldn't even think of something like that. But, but in that era, you know, that's how things were handled. You just you smack somebody around. And um, in some ways, there was an innocence to it because that's how things were settled. Uh, you have a dispute in the neighborhood, two guys, they have a fist fight, one wins, one loses, and you live to fight another day. You know, it wasn't like you have a fight and then now five guys come back with, with semi-automatic guns. And you know, it was a more innocent time in that respect. And you know, when you were hit by your teachers, <laughs> you, know, you, you didn't dare go back to your parents and tell them. Because the first question would be, well, what did you do that they had to hit you? <laughs> You know, and you'd be in trouble all over again. So it, it really was a, uh, I mean, I can't say it was a violent you know, neighborhood, like it, it, it happened you know, on the hour, but it was a, um, there was always that threat. And uh, there were, there's, particularly in an alcoholic household, uh, there's always that threat. You just don't know what's going to happen when that guy walks through the door. Is it going to be the happy drunk? Is it going to be the mean drunk? Is it going to be the angry drunk? 
Uh, and that's something that I think is universal in all alcoholic households. You know, no matter what the class, no matter what the neighborhood, no matter you know where that is, I think that's something that people who have lived that way will will definitely relate to. Now, the title "White Irish Drinkers" has come under some criticism, John on our Radio Irish Facebook page, with Irish Emmy Award-winning writer and filmmaker Alan Cook calling the title a racist, slanderous title, adding that if he mentioned the Jewish or Japanese race with the same stereotypical manner, he would be sued. (laughs) What do you say to Alan Cook's criticism of your film's title, John? Well, I, I appreciate it, and, and uh, you know, it's not the first time we've heard that, and we knew that we would get you know, some of that. Uh, I do think that if you see the movie, you know, I always have a problem with people who, who make judgments about things they haven't seen yet. And I think if you see the movie, you understand that it's not a racist movie at all. It's, it's literally about a group of particular people in a particular neighborhood at a particular time. And the, the name is what they call themselves. Um, you know, this is a group of kids who are resisting the drug culture that's taking hold in the 70s. Uh, this is the era, don't forget, of you know, hard hats versus hippies, and there was this whole sea change going on in the, that society. And you know, these guys were proud of the fact that they did not do drugs, they didn't, they didn't do needles, they didn't do pills, they drank. They were white Irish drinkers, that's what they call themselves, that's where the title of the movie you know, really comes from. Uh, and I think if you see the movie, you, you get that. And um, but the, you know, I understand. I mean, I, I definitely look. If I if I meant to slur the Irish, you know, I would have just just called it you know white Irish and assumed that you'd know that it was about drinkers. Yeah. You know? uh, so I, it's not that. And also, I think that we've been embraced uh, you know by the Irish community in, in a in a big way that has been very gratifying. Uh, we just got a wonderful review on uh, IrishCentral.com, and the Irish Echo has reviewed us favorably and, and done stories about the film. And uh, so, you know, I, 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 I can see how someone might have a knee-jerk reaction to the title. I would just say, hey, you know, give the movie a chance, watch the movie, and see what we're really trying to do. Now, the film cost you some money, John. How do you define the risk involved in making an independent movie like White Irish Drinkers? Has it been worth it so far? Well, absolutely. I mean, it was worth it the day I started shooting. Uh, you know, it was a uh, it was a, it was a bit of a gamble, but this was a movie that I just ultimately felt if I didn't make it, I was going to go mad. I just I just had to get this movie out of me, and I couldn't raise money in the traditional ways. And um, you know, I was fortunate enough to have this television series on the air, which which stayed on the air for five years. So I had some financial uh, freedom, uh, you know, some some financial uh, play uh, room to play with, and uh, I just decided I'm gonna. I just have to make it, and I'm I'm in a very fortunate position uh, that I've been making movies and television for I don't know maybe 25 years or so by now, and I was able to call on a lot of uh, uh, a lot of people in the business to help me, and it's kind of like a it's so you could do once in your life, you know, <laughs> you can't go back to the trough again, but you know, one time I could. I could ask people, hey, you know, come with me on this movie and let's let's try to do this. I have no money to pay you, but you know, we'll do a deferral deal or we'll do whatever. And so many of, of you know, so many people just said, yeah, let's you know, let's do that and let's uh, let's take this skill set that we have uh, to make movies cheaply and, and and economically and in an organized way, and let's use it to do one for us. And uh, I was very fortunate to have a lot of friends who. who um, you know, came and, and uh, you know, one of my very closest friends uh, arranged us had the whole sound package uh, for the movie, which is a very expensive item, done on a deferral. And you know, we got a wonderful, you know, stereo surround sound mix and, and all the all those things. My composer, who's been with me for twenty odd years, he did the score for me for free. And, and you know, it just it, it was a matter of, of being able to line up people to say, okay, we're with you and we'll we'll do this. Well, it certainly does look and sound like a multi-million dollar movie. Now, John, talk to me a bit about your cast and the atmosphere on set there in Bay Ridge, Brooklyn. What kind of experience was the shoot? I believe it was shot in 17 days or thereabouts. Yes, we shot in 17 days. And, um, I mean, oddly enough, the shooting was really the easiest part of the whole process. Uh, I mean, you're not easy in the sense that it was a breeze. I mean, we did long hours, and, and any time you make a movie, it's, it's it's a bit of a marathon, even on a short schedule. But, 
again, you know, because I've been doing it for so long, and Paul Bernard and Melissa Peltier and Jim Skura, we've all been working in television and features, and and we understand. You know, I mean, we, we may we may have no talent, but at least we understand how to do things uh, uh, you know, economically and quickly. And so we were able to bring that. Uh, to the making of this movie, and so everything was really well organized. Um, we didn't really do very many long days at all. We had a couple long days, but you know, not what you usually get on a movie on, on this level. And you know, the actors, we had we had some rehearsal time, so we had a chance to walk through all the scenes and talk through all the scenes. So it wasn't like we were trying to find the scene on the set. We all came knowing what the scene was about, knowing what the intentions were. And I'd work with the cameraman in advance. We knew where the camera was going to go, and it really was a very smooth thing. Uh, and at the same time, we were, we left ourselves open for the odd happy accident, which happens, and um, you know, which is always fun. Um, but you know, it was very pleasurable. It was just a wonderful, you know, family, just a wonderful family of people, and everyone felt like they were working on something that was, um, you know, worth worth doing, which is great. And uh, everyone just brought their A game, and, and it was a really pleasurable experience uh, all in all. And uh, I'll give an example of, of, you talk about the difference between TV and features and, and independent cinema and, and the advantage of paying for something yourself. The original schedule for the movie was 16 days, and you know, we, were, we were on schedule to do that. But um, there was, there was a, a one day of shooting, that, uh, or about a half a day, uh, that a mistake had been made in the lighting and the scene was really just not lit properly. And I kind of agonized over this. It was in the first week of shooting. And it was the kind of thing where it was acceptable. It was probably okay. We could probably cut around some of the bad lighting, but we couldn't use some of the better takes performance-wise. And it was probably about a $35,000 hit to reshoot those scenes and add a day to the schedule. And I went back and forth on it. And ultimately, I just decided... You know what? I got to do it. I mean, I've come this far. I'm spending six hundred thousand dollars on the movie. I can't not spend thirty-five thousand to get this scene right and to do right by the actors and to really make this work. And what was wonderful about that is that it was a decision I just could make and then do. I didn't have to play Mother May I with a studio or with a network or go begging or please. You know, I was just able to swallow <laughs> and, and be terrified, but I could just do it. And that's. You know, that alone is, is, is an experience worth having at least once in your life in this business. Now, what makes this movie Irish, John? Or is it an Irish story? Could you define it that way? Or Yeah, in many ways, I don't really feel that it's a particularly Irish story. I mean, it takes place in a neighborhood that was largely Irish back in that, in that period. And the characters are all American Irish, except for Jimmy Cheeks, who's, who's, who's uh, Irish born. Uh, that, that character, um, played by the great Ken Jennings. Um, but, uh, anyway, it's really, and again, this is why when people react to the title, they, they're doing so without really understanding the movie. Um, it's really, you know, more about this group of people at, at this time and place uh, who happen to be Irish. They, they are, uh, uh, you know, they're, they're attached to the culture of the American Irish and, and proud of it and, and involved in it. But it's not particularly a movie um, you know, that, that will only appeal to someone who's Irish. You know, that would appeal to someone who's not Irish. It, it's not that at all. Now, White Irish Drinkers has already received great response and recognition in a range of film festivals from Torino, Italy to Toronto, Canada and beyond. Do you think, John, that an independent movie like White Irish Drinkers could go all the way and into widespread distribution and maybe even into larger award ceremonies? Or is the journey of an independent movie somewhat limited these days? in a world of special effects and big budgets? Well, you know, that's a, that's a really great question, and that's, that's something I grapple with myself uh, a lot, because the kind of movies that I want to make, you know, not necessarily on a low-budget, independent scale, but you know, the movies that I'm really drawn to are you know, character-driven uh, dramas. And that really is kind of an endangered species. Uh, in this you know, current environment, and I don't really know the answer to your question. What I, what I do know is this: that it, when you when you make a movie like this, you can't make it because you want to get awards or you want to get wide distribution. You know, you you really can't. You have to make it because you got to make it. And I was fully prepared when I made this film that 
it, it may it may go nowhere that it may end up playing for my friends and I in my home theater <laughs> uh, and you have to be at peace with that you know I have to be at peace with the fact that I might never see this money again but no matter what I'll always be able to say I made the movie and you know now that we're getting some really wonderful attention and I'm hoping that people will respond to it and they'll turn out for it and I hope that word of mouth will build because that's really the only way a movie like this you know can succeed it's about people telling people go see it um, but you know ultimately the victory for me and the actors is having made a film that we're proud of and that we feel came pretty close to the movie we wanted to make and then the rest is really about you know <laughs> does God see fit to you know, have, have people go and see it and, and uh, to a certain extent there's, there's very little control one has over that uh, particularly when there's not a huge marketing budget and, and that kind of thing but you know I'm hoping that people will turn out for the movie I think they're I mean, one of the wonderful things for me and not to blather on about the difference between TV and movies again but one of the great pleasures for me in this movie is that watching it with an audience which we've done now in so many film festival screenings all over the world and here in, in this country and in previous screenings that we've had um, and watching people react to it you know hearing them laugh and knowing they're crying hearing them gasp uh, that it's just so rewarding and after working so many years in television where you don't you know you're disconnected from the audience you don't really know I mean you look at the numbers oh the ratings are good so I guess people are watching oh 12 million people watch that episode it's kind of abstract because you're not sitting there with them uh, but that's been the greatest joy for me is to just sit there with this movie and listen to people respond and, and watch them respond to the actors and so I really do believe that if enough people get out to see it uh, that um, you know, the word can spread and that the movie can have a life and is it easier to direct what you have written yourself, John? Uh, yes, there's no question about it. There's no. I mean, I have not directed many. I've only directed a, a small handful of things that I hadn't written. And it's always a great thing to do because it's a wonderful exercise and it's a great uh, learning tool to get into somebody else's head um, uh, and, and direct a movie. But ultimately, for me, they're kind of linked. They're, there's almost no difference. When I write a script, I write it with how I'm going to direct it in mind. Uh, and and you know, they're, they're just kind of one thing. So uh, it's really, really gratifying to be able to do it. Well, we wish you every success with White Irish Drinkers, John, and we hope you return to us here on Radio Irish to talk about your future projects. Thank you for joining us, John. Sean, thank you for your support uh, for the movie and, and, and by extension for independent cinema, you know, which is just crucial to us. And, and uh, we appreciate that and, and we love your show. And, and uh, I'll come back on any time. You just tell me when. Writer, producer, director, John Gray whose new movie, White Irish Drinkers, is blazing a trail across the big screens at various different festivals. And you can find out all about the movie at www.whiteirishdrinkersthemovie.com. And there's a man who knows about film and television. Sure hasn't he been in the industry for some 25 years. And his beautiful wife, Melissa Jo Peltier, is a producer so the team make up quite a force in the independent film industry. America's only Irish station, RadioIrish.com.